Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, choosing to come to my talk. It's an honor to be here. And I am looking forward to teaching you some of the secrets I've learned about how to operate and scale platform engineering. So today, I'm going to be sharing with you nine different lessons about how your teams can be more productive and happier and more comfortable in production. So how did we get to this point where I'm needing to give lectures about how to, you know, as it were, do DevOps correctly, right? DevOps says, you know, here are the five aspirational things that you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to focus on a positive culture. You're supposed to automate things. You're supposed to have fast feedback cycles. You're supposed to measure, and you're, you're supposed to have a culture of sharing within your team, right? And if you just do these five magical things, everything gets better, right? Well. And fortunately, it's not really specific enough. So let's talk about measurement then, and let's use some of the lessons of the Dora team that, uh, that went to Google. So what the Dora team says is that we really should focus on how often do we deploy? What's our lead time to push changes out? If things break, how quickly can we get the service running again? And if things fail to go out correctly, how long does it take us to, uh, to get it fixed, and what percentage of changes are successful? And there are, of course, some categories for what constitutes low, medium, or high performance. But why did I use the word generative at the start? Because to me, a generative team is a team that's focused on self-improvement, a team that's willing and able to criticize itself. And that matters to me a lot more than whether you're a low, medium, or high performer. What I care about is, can you get to the next category? Are you always looking to improve yourself? But knowing what the measurements are is not sufficient to improve. There are a couple of different reasons why. Number one, because none of these things say, here's what you do to improve. Number two, you can't really figure out, like, you know, what am I supposed to do at each incremental step? And when you do measure, how do I know whether a regression in my build times is the team doing the right thing or whether it is that our metrics have actually regressed? So that brings us to Goodhart's law, which is any measure that is used as, a, uh, as, as, as something that you're actually grading people on winds up being gamed. And we also have this kind of idea that if, if we're at the top, top of the maturity model, we can stop improving, right? We're good enough, right? But that's not really true. We always should be aspiring to do better. So how do we do that? Well, one thing that I think is pretty clear is teams are getting stuck even when measured according to the door metrics, even when we have these metrics that people you know, could be gaming. What the Google team has found is over the years that the number of high-performing teams stays about the same, or even perhaps people have regressed a little bit. Google speculates it's because of the pandemic and people having kind of coordination barriers. But in either case, there's this group of performers who are struggling with software delivery who are not quite able to get software out repeatedly and reliably. So I think that th that means that it's important to continue to share these lessons about how to advance our teams and scale them and make them work. So if measuring the door metrics doesn't help people improve in and of itself, what does help teams improve? So today I'm going to be sharing with you the nine secrets for a generative culture that enables you to enhance your software development practices and move safer and quick, quicker in production. So I'll go through all of these, of course, during the talk, but I just figured that I would give you a quick guidepost as to where I'm going and how I'm going to get your teams kind of through those initial building blocks and into having a, t a practice that is fully systematized, that is fully rolled out across all of your teams. I see people taking slide, uh, pictures of the slides, so I'll just hold it there for a second. All right. <laughs> this is the fun of live talks, right? Cool. Um, so as I was just introduced, um, I've been the field CTO of Honeycomb for about a year now. And prior to that, I was a developer advocate at Honeycomb for three years. And then before that, I worked at Google um, for about 11 years as a site reliability engineer. And one of the things I consistently saw was that many of the teams that I worked with across the industry in trying to help them develop site reliability practices, and here's a secret, Google even doesn't do all of these things consistently, right? So I, I think that there's a lot of education that needs to be done about how to improve teams. And 
the first thing is you have to be able to deploy your infrastructure and deploy your code repeatedly. If it isn't in Git, it doesn't exist. So we really have to have a solid building base of hermetic infrastructure, which is infrastructure that is self-contained, can be stood up from source code, and that doesn't have any tricky external dependencies or kind of monkey patching or anything weird where you are SSHing onto individual machines. So I personally don't care whether you're using Docker or whether you're using raw EC2 images, right? Like what I care about is you have some mechanism of always being able to boot a new machine and having it come up in the, in the same clean state, which probably means that you're going to need some combination of Chef, Packer, and Docker in order to get that done. And you're going to want to have the ability to repeatedly roll out new machines to adjust your configuration. And yes, I'm very much aware of the uh, recent spat over Terraform. I don't really care which one of these things you use, Terraform, OpenTofu, as long as you're using something that enables you to control your infrastructure in production. And orchestration is important, right? But you don't have to use Kubernetes for it necessarily. You can just push out tarballs and have them pushed out to machines. Because that's actually a secret about Honeycomb until about two years ago, we weren't using Kubernetes at all. Um, so you can get surprisingly far without it, but if you do choose to use it, it is useful. So why does this matter? Why does it matter to have repeatable infrastructure? I think it boils down to GitOps enables you to treat your infrastructure as code and really have that reproducibility to have code review, to have all these wonderful software development practices and kind of apply those methodologies to what was traditionally you know, the domain of an operations team. And this means that you have the ability not just to move forward more safely, but also to roll back more quickly and roll back more safely because you always have a known good state that you can restore to. And this means that your teams are no longer clobbering each other or otherwise causing problems for each other with making co uh, colliding changes. And when you get rid of click ops of, you know, show of hands, how many of you, you know, go into the Amazon or the Azure or the GCP console to make changes? Okay, that's actually surprisingly low. Um, how many of you uh, do it regularly? Okay. That's much better, right? So I think it's really important to make sure that the right thing is the fast thing, that it is always going to be faster in addition to more correct uh, to deploy things via making pull requests rather than uh, clicking around in the console. And this means that you can have continuous integration. You can test things before they roll out. You can have feature flags, right? You can control what percentage of the fleet gets an upgrade and you can just take it step by step and apply unit tests along the way. So that's kind of the first layer is, can we roll out base images? But the second part is, how do we roll out new application deploys? So this is where going quickly really, really enhances the velocity of your teams. So when we wind up uh, having tools like CircleCI, GitHub Actions, uh, BuildKite, you know, there's any number of options here. But the point is that some degree of templating and reproducibility of builds and not only that, but enabling you to just say, I want to throw more money at this in order to make it go faster. If you have the tooling to do that, it can enable you to make your builds really, really lightning fast. Why does this matter? Because chances are, if you're developing software, your time as a software developer is going to be far more valuable than the cost of throwing one or two more machines at doing the build. So the faster you can make the build, the faster your feedback loop, and the less tempted you'll be to push something out without passing CI, the less tempted you'll be to go and get a coffee and dump all that state out of your brain while you're waiting for the build. So at Honeycomb, where I work, we aim to have a 10-minute build. And we track that performance over time, and we actually set objectives to make sure that we never regress past 15-minute builds. So in practice, this is our actual, uh, this is our actual build time. And you can see that we are, broadly speaking, meeting our goal of 15 minutes, although there's a little bit of room for improvement to get it back down to the target of 10 minute build times. So we have a few advantages here, right? We're using a mono repo, but we're also using CircleCI again. You know, again, it doesn't have to be CircleCI, but this is the tool that I know best. We're able to evaluate what's the performance of this. And in particular, anytime one of the steps gets too slow, we're going to either split it into two concurrent steps that can run side by side and try to break that dependency as much as possible. Or if it's something that's paralyzable, 
for instance, running the full test suite, we might choose to run the test suite in thirds and run each third in parallel. But of course, be mindful of Omdahl's law, right? You might have to set up a database. If setting up the database takes three minutes, you're never going to make your test suite run faster than three and a half or four minutes, right? The other really crucial thing here is caching your dependencies and otherwise making it so that adding new dependencies doesn't create this fence painting problem of now I have n plus one dependencies, now I have to unpack and install them all, right? It's just much, much faster to have everything pre-canned, ready to go, ready to run tests the instant that the uh, build tree initializes. When you do these builds in containers, it means that you can bin pack them onto resizable compute nodes. You can say, I want to change from an x large instance to a two x large instance, or I want to run these on two different instances. But as much as I've talked about the CI piece, the CD piece is also really, really key, that you have to make the rollouts quick. You have to make sure that if you have a new build artifact, you know what the procedure is for getting that build artifact out into production as quickly as possible. And maybe in your infrastructure, maybe it's not you know, one hour, maybe it's one day or two days, right? Like that's fine. But the important piece is that you're focusing on continuous improvement. How do I make this go faster? So this is where having some visibility comes in. And speaking of visibility, let's talk about observability. So my boss, Charity Majors, says often that you shouldn't you know, get out, of, get out of the house in the morning, get into your car, and just drive off with snow on the windshield, right? You might crash into something, or you might have snow fall off, fly off of your roof and hit someone else, right? That's no fun. So the point of observability is to enable us to debug things that we didn't think about in advance. Because no one deliberately says, I want to go out there and write a bug that's going to crash or delete all of the data in production, right? No one wants to do that. Everyone is a conscientious software developer here. And we try to write unit tests. We try to debug things. We try to make sure that things are in solid shape before they go out to production. But no matter what, there's always going to be some kind of n known n knowns, things that we can't predict that wind up going wrong as part of the inherent complexity of our software systems. So this means that we have to be able to figure out what's going on in production that we didn't anticipate when we wrote the code. And we can't just go ahead and say, you know, I want to take two weeks to reproduce this in staging. Like that doesn't fly with our customers. Our customers expect us to be able to fix issues within hours rather than fix issues within days or weeks. So the key insight about observability is that we have to be able to form and test hypotheses. We can't just be constrained to query only pre-existing dashboards, pre-existing fields. We have to think about, here's the state of the entire system. How do I make that system model fit the model that's in my head? So the best way to do that is to be able to think of questions that will help reconcile that state and to help us really figure out how does the state not conform to what I think is going on and how do I bring it into a state of working? So for instance, I might want to say, OK, you know, I want to figure out what are the slowest customers by team name that are using this particular endpoint. And that's something that you know, I happen to dog food honeycomb to do this. But you could do this in a number of similar observability tools. The key element here is being able to ask arbitrary questions and to get answers to those questions. And in particular, to figure out what distinguishes a slow or failing request from a successful request. What distinguishes a happy customer from an unhappy customer? But beyond break fix, we also have to think about how do we debug things across the entire life cycle where debugging is more generally defined. We might want to have things like making sure that our unit tests run predictably, making sure that our CA processes run smoothly enough making sure that customers are actually using the features that we build so that we're not wasting time building features that our customers are not actually using. We also have to think about observability as this overall process. It's not just about collecting you know, uh, logs, traces, metrics. They're not Pokemon. You don't have to collect them all. The important thing is being able to really, really dig in and understand. And that starts with being able to add instrumentation to ergonomically develop the uh, fields and values and kind of infrastructure and scaffolding so that you can see what's going on inside of your applications, even if you didn't predict what questions you might be asking. And yes, you have to be able to store that data somewhere that's economical enough. 
And then we have to, most importantly, be able to query that data to ask arbitrary questions broken down by arbitrary fields or values in order to get to the bottom of what's going on. So the outcome is what matters. And teams have to be able to feel curious about what's going on in production in order to really achieve a state of good observability. Similar to testability, it's not like, you know, do you have testability or not? Yes or no, right? Like that, that's not a meaningful question, right? So similarly, observability is this state of being in sync with your systems. And no matter what tooling you're using, you should do the instrumentation bit with open telemetry because that's kind of the common standard that everyone is using across our industry in order to ensure portability, vendor neutrality, and rich instrumentation. Okay, so the fourth secret, feature flagging. So a lot of us may have fear of exploding all of production, right? If you explode all of production, then you've created a giant mess. Everyone is, you know, maybe wondering what's going on with that team? What's going on with that service? So how do we make it so that we're not afraid of moving in production? How do we make it so that we're not afraid that, you know, anywhere I go stepping, I'm going to step on a landmine and everything's going to explode, right? So the secret here is, that was weird. Uh, so the secret here is we have to be able to limit the blast radius by user and by component. You know, that was funny. I didn't plan that. But actually, I'm going to point out here, the blast radius was relatively small, right? Like my laptop didn't crash. I just accidentally blanked the screen. So I think I'm going to roll with that. Um, so when you make it so that failures are smaller and more incremental, it makes you less afraid that you might make a mistake that blows everything up. So in order to practice uh, feature flagging, you are going to need some automation or some code. So it is possible to write rudimentary feature flags and say, you know, just roll the die. If the die, if the die is two ones, then you're going to serve the user uh, some more experimental code. But it turns out that that has a lot of pitfalls and dragons. So over time, people wind up gravitating towards uh, more professional solutions like LaunchDarkly or Optimizely. Again, the important thing here is, can you define feature flags? Can you control them at runtime? Can you make sure that there's a reliable infrastructure for delivering safe defaults in the event that service is not available? And can you see the results of your experiments and actually cross-check them and look, in fact, at your observability tooling to see maybe there's some combination of feature flags that is causing more users to experience pain than, than others. So we really, really happen to like that ability to flag things on my team ID. That way we can run smaller experiments just on our internal teams or maybe roll it out to a subset of customers. And that way we can kind of more incrementally roll things out without fearing that this new code that we released might break 100% of production. The other element that really, really helps in feature flagging is kind of developing a sense for when is it safe to do an experiment and when should we err on the side of caution? Or how quickly should we roll through from 0% to 1% to 5% to 10%, right? Like how quickly should we, we be rolling through in order to get to 100% coverage of the flag in production? So I'll tell you a little bit more about this this afternoon if you choose to join me at the closing uh, talk. But this is an experiment that we ran where we rolled it out to 50% uh, of users, and it broke rather horribly, so we had to roll it back to 1% of users, right? So the good news is we were able to do it very, very quickly, and we didn't break production for very long. But that was something where I learned the lesson that if we have the option to roll it to 5 or 10% before 50%, maybe don't skip those steps from 1% to 50%. So feature flagging really gives you that power to feel more in control of your code. So speaking of being in control of your code, let's talk about the fifth secret, which is code ownership. Now, a lot of people have talked about this idea of you build it, you run it. And I think that it's valid to say that teams ought to run their own code in production. But I think one of the things that we've gotten wrong in terms of this messaging is being way too prescriptive about it and saying, you know, thou shalt carry a pager for thy code, right? Like, I don't think that that's necessarily quite as helpful if teams are not able to develop that shared understanding of what's going on in production. If you're afraid of production as it is because it's unreliable and it's breaking all the time and you don't have the right mental model of what's going on to feel safe making changes, I'm not going to hand you a hot pager and say, congratulations, have fun. 
feedback loops will just make you fix it better, right? Like that's not actually how this works. When you give people a hot pager and they're not prepared to deal with it, then you're going to wind up having engineers get woken up all the time. They're going to eventually shut off the pager. They might resign from the team. That's not a situation that benefits anyone. And even if you have one person on a team who says, yes, I feel comfortable charging ahead and running production, that doesn't mean everyone else on the team has been brought along with them. So how do we ensure that that knowledge is better spread out? How do we make sure that people are able to safely move in production, make smaller changes, and feel like they own their software? Well, one answer is start with you know, making your deploys more predictable. Start by making it so that every engineer who's working on the team is comfortable rather than just that one hero. Because otherwise, you're going to end up in a state of operational overload or, or of too much technical debt where people feel like they have to maintain this system that they're barely holding on to. So we have to equip people to have the right models in their head and to gather knowledge from each other and to level up that skill set so that they can feel comfortable working in production. And this is more of an investment in the people, culture, and process than in, in any one piece of technology. So when we slow down a bit, and before handing people a hot pager, ask the question of, have we satisfied some of these earlier constraints first? Right? Can people ship changes in a smaller, more blast radius uh, friendly, friendly manner? Can we make it so that people have more of a safe generative culture? Then we can encourage knowledge sharing and get the team to be able to operate the service as an entire entity and not just with one hero propping everyone up. So that brings us to the sixth secret, which is about blameless culture, right? How do we make sure that we're developing a culture where we continuously learn lessons every time something goes wrong? It does not make sense to shame people, right? I can't go and say, you know, Bente, like, how, how dare you have, have, have broken production, right? Do you, do you think she's, she's going to, you know, be, be nice to me after that? Do you think that she's going to own up to, you know, her code breaking, breaking production? Probably not. So we have to really build up everyone's confidence and make sure that people feel comfortable engaging in asking questions to expand their knowledge, right? It's OK to not know things. As a relatively senior engineer in my company, I think that one of the best things I can do to model humility is to always feel comfortable asking the so-called stupid questions, because there are genuinely areas of the code base that I don't know well. And if I don't know them well, right, no one else should be expected to know them. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to have people feel ashamed to ask, like, hey, what's that service for? Or how does that work? Or can you walk me through how you do this process? We also have to rehearse, right? We have to do game days. We have to do disaster drills. We have to make sure that we are continuously practicing things before we put them into production. So we need to make sure that we understand how does the incident management process at my company work? Or what happens if this particular class of uh, services goes down? And how do we make sure that we are evenly distributing this knowledge among the team? How do we make sure that people are comfortable escalating when they need to but also to gradually over time minimize the number of escalations by making sure that everything that people need to know is either discoverable from observability or is something that's written down in the playbooks. So that means that we have to solve this problem where people feel like you know, their job security is tied up in the number of people who are queued up outside their door waiting to ask them a question, right? In fact, we are doing a better job as staff and principal engineers if we're sharing that knowledge out so that anyone on our team feels comfortable making changes on their own without having to consult us, right? We shouldn't be gatekeeping production or gatekeeping architecture. So this means that we have to have a culture of thanking people for asking questions, for really rewarding people for their curiosity and for working together rather than kind of being the lone cowboy who goes out and fixes production. And yes, tooling can help after a culture is solid, but you're not going to use tooling to fix a broken team, right? So when you're learning from your incidents, you know, yes, you, could, you should start by first making sure that people even feel safe talk, speaking up and raising their hands and saying, you know, yes, I triggered that outage. And then you can start writing down those lessons. There are templates from the Google S3 book, for instance, about how to do a manual retrospective. And then in order to systematize it, there are plenty of tools that are out there that will help you learn from incidents at scale. Tools like Blameless or Jelly or Fire Hydrant really help you 
with that process of getting those insights out of people's heads and onto paper where you can understand how to improve your systems based off of what went wrong during incidents. And not just improve your technical systems, but improve the way that your teams collaborate. So the seventh secret that I have for you is about service level objectives. How do we make sure that we are appropriately measuring the level of reliability that our customers are seeing? How are we making sure that our customers are having a good experience in production? So that's what the uh, shirt says. If you, if you liked it, you should have put an SLO on it. Uh, shout out to Beyonce. Um, so the, the point here is that we have to think about what are the critical user journeys, right? What are our customers trying to do with our software? How do we know if they're being successful? So service level indicators and service level objectives are this tool that helps us get on the same page with our customers and our product managers about what's going on with our user happiness. So in order to measure a service level objective, we have to think about how do we, you know, what, how do we identify those critical user journey events, right? How does that turn up in the telemetry in our observability tooling? And then what are the relevant elements of context around them, right? User IDs, uh, build IDs, uh, latency baby, uh, request IDs, right? Like these are all important things that we need to know in order to be able to both measure and debug our service level objectives. And at the end of the day, we need to know, you know, is this event good or bad, right? Like, is this transaction something that met the user's expectations, or is it something that maybe might have disappointed them? So, for instance, maybe, you know, if I were to click next slide right now and it took 500 milliseconds or 1,000 milliseconds, maybe that's not such a good thing, right? That's a sign that my expectations of the customer are not being met. So, we have to think about you know, what is the critical thing that causes a user to feel like, yes, I had a smooth experience, or uh, that was a little bit too slow. So when we think about that threshold, right, like that's something where user research can really help us to understand, you know, if it's an e-commerce site, you might expect that paying with a credit card might take significantly longer than adding an item to a shopping cart. Where you, you want adding an item to a shopping cart to be very fast, but people have an expectation that payments are not instantaneous. So kind of figuring out for each event what makes it successful or not, and then calculating the availability based off of that. What's the number of good events divided by the number of eligible events? Side note, why did I say eligible events and not all events? The answer is all events are going to be too inclusive. It'll include things that are out of scope. It might include things like uh, traffic from your uh, load testing tools, uh, traffic from health checks, traffic from your local friendly neighborhood botnet. Those are things that you want to exclude from your service level objective. You only want to include the things that are relevant customer journeys, that are actual real customer journeys. So once we have those metrics and we can say, okay, how long are we measuring them over and what target percentage should, should we be aiming for? So. When we're talking about a window, um, you know, my customers would laugh at me, right? If I came, if I came to you and I said, "Guess what? Honeycomb was 100% down yesterday. Don't worry, we're 100% up today," right? Like you'd laugh me out of the room, right? So we have to think about that kind of longer time scale of how do we measure reliability, availability, and so forth over a, a period of weeks, if not months, right? So 30 days is not a bad default in terms of people will generally forgive you for having an outage 30 days ago, but they're not going to forgive you having an outage every other day. So pick an appropriate window and also pick an appropriate target percentage. So why do I say, you know, appropriate target percentage? Why not 100%? And the answer is that 100% uh, is just not realistic, right? Like we have to pick something that's actually meaningful and relevant to our users. Uh, so, for instance, my cell phone, which is sitting right there somewhere, um, my cell phone is probably about only 99.95% .9 available, right? Like, it sometimes doesn't get service. Like, I turned my phone on yesterday when I got into the, into the Copenhagen airport, and it took about, you know, half an hour or so to establish service, right? So, it turns out that users do not anticipate that every single service is going to be 100% available. And even if they did, they'd be wrong because they have other dependencies in the chain that are going to be less than 100% available. So you can only be as reliable as you know, the connection that a user is connecting to you on. So don't aim for 100%. Pick something that's cheaper to run. And what does having a target that's less than 100% let you do? It lets you have an error budget. It lets you say, this is the amount of allowed and availability that I'm allowed to have. 
And how long is it until I run out? So for instance, if I have a million requests that are coming in per week, and I'm aiming for 99.9% .9 availability, that means one in a thousand of those are allowed to fail, which means that I'm allowed to have a thousand bad requests out of the million per week. So if I'm burning through 100 bad requests per hour, that means that I'm going to run through my error budget in a matter of 10 hours. If I'm only having 10 bad requests per hour, I have, I have 100 hours until I run out of my error budget, right? So this lets me have a sense of urgency, of prioritization. And that enables me to no longer treat every single error as a paging emergency. Instead, it lets me say, I want to have a little bit more sophisticated of an idea of how to measure and fix my services. So observability works really well with this because you're already gathering the data from your services about what the performance is, about kind of what, what makes your services more or less reliable. So it's best to align your observability and your service level objectives in the same tooling, or at least to have the two tools talking to each other. So many folks that I know wind up using a tool like Noble9 or Blameless, um, but many of the observability tooling, including uh, yours truly, we support kind of measuring service level objectives in the tooling itself so that you can really kind of get down to, okay, my service level objective is burning, why? What events are most correlated with that service level objective going off? Okay, so let's talk about the eighth secret, which is chaos engineering. So once we have a solid grasp on those first seven things, one of the things that we can do is really start testing our assumptions about what holds true about our system. And I alluded to that earlier in terms of safe, uh, what I was talking about feature flags, right? If your blast radius is smaller, you can test smaller parts of your system without running the risk of breaking everything. So when we have sufficient error budget left, right? Obviously, if your system is already so on fire that you're breaking your service level objectives all the time, you have plenty to work on, right? Like fix those things first before you move on to doing chaos engineering. But once your system is reliably and repeatedly running better than your target, then use that leftover target either to speed up your innovation or to make sure that, to invest, to make sure that you're going to be able to achieve that reliability the next month and the next month after that. So how do we do that? We run careful targeted and controlled experiments with learning objectives in mind and psychological safety, right? It has to be safe to break production and to learn from it and roll it back rather than have people ask you like, why did you break production, right? If you break production, but only to a small extent, that means that you're still within your surface level objective and you've learned something before it broke 100% of production sometime down the road. That's not to say that you should just go around breaking things at random, right? It's important to make sure that you have a hypothesis in mind, something that you want to test and some kind of success or failure criterion for the experiment. So safety comes in two parts, as I was just saying, right? It's the psychological safety of knowing that if your experiment goes wrong, that's a success as well, right? You've learned something that you need to fix before you can try again. And also, there's a technical safeguard, right? Like we need to make sure that we have containments so that we can quickly turn off misbehaving experiments and make sure that they're contained to a smaller area of production. So the best way that I recommend to get started with chaos engineering is to restart one server and one service at a time, right? So don't necessarily move immediately to, I want to try failing 50% of requests in this availability zone, right? Start by just saying, can we tolerate having Kubernetes replace one node, right? Can we actually test whether that works without dropping any requests? And better yet, we should be doing this when everyone is at work rather than when people are uh, asleep. Because if you do it when people are asleep, there's fewer hands around to help out in case of the problem. And the more knowledge you're able to bring to bear on a problem, and the more that everyone can participate in an experiment and learn together, the more that you're going to wind up learning from it rather than having the lessons evaporate in the ether. And when things do go wrong or something goes unexpectedly, that's fine. Because if you invest in observability, that means that you'll be able to figure out why did the experiment not go according to plan and how can I repeat it next time and be sure that it's gonna work correctly. So one thing that you can do after you've kind of run those simple experiments of, for instance, restarting one server, one service at a time manually, is then you can start asking questions like, okay, how do I make my service resilient to being disrupted up to 10 times per hour? 
how do I actually verify that if I restart my service eight times per hour that it works correctly? So this is where kind of design and automation and tooling can really help us. So there are tools such as Gremlin and Verica that offer chaos as a service, but it's important to only do those things after you've first done manual game days, after you've first verified that you can run those manual experiments and then start continuously rolling them out through the fleet or rolling them out in a more programmatic way. So the first eight things I think are lessons that you can take and apply to your own engineering team. But wouldn't it be nice if every team at your company didn't have to reinvent and relearn all eight of those things each time on their own? So this is where I think the role of platform engineering and platform teams really, really comes in. Because it is important for software developers to write and own their code in production. That is 100% true. But they don't have to do that entirely on their own. You can offer them support and options to really help them figure out what's the best way of doing things and to advance that state of practice across the entire company. Just as I was saying earlier that you, know, you should bring the uh, least uh, experienced engineer on your team up to, up to the level of the best engineer on your team, right, to spread that knowledge out across, across the engineers on one team, we also should be thinking about how do we spread those lessons out across multiple teams so that each team is learning from the other teams in the business. So what we do in platform engineering, really, is to enable software development teams to write and own their code in production and really force multiplying them to give them a smoother development experience that is a little bit more paved so that everyone is not having to, to choose their own path through the wilderness. So how is platform engineering different from ops or DevOps or SRE? Well, you know, back in the day, operations engineering was the set of people who were carrying this burning pager, right? Who, who were responsible for running the production operations. But when we think about not just ops, but operations engineering as a whole, right? Like, then maybe it relates to this idea of everyone on a team should be responsible for operational excellence, right? That we're all doing engineering here, so maybe we're all doing ops. But as it turns out, as, as we just learned, right? Like, leaving teams to learn these lessons the hard way on their own. It's like telling people, you know what? I'm going to teach you to uh, walk across coals. Have fun. Here's a bed of burning coals, right? Like, we, we don't do that, right? Like, we need to make sure that we're offering people a smoother path. So DevOps, like I opened the talk with, right? Like, it's a set of culture, cultural philosophies and tools, right? Like, it's a set of mechanisms that tell us how should we aspire in terms of cultural values to be running teams to enable developers to self-improve? But again, it kind of doesn't really offer a paved path. So this is where we had uh, these kind of two convergent movements, right? We had the DevOps movement that was kind of championed by some of the folks from Etsy, some of the folks who attended some of the, uh, early, when O'Reilly was running conferences, some of the O'Reilly web development conferences. So that was DevOps. And then in parallel, SRE was this group of folks at Google who got together to kind of imagine what it would be like to run uh, software systems with software, to really develop, uh, develop that software engineering expertise and to bring it to operations. And when we finally kind of had this open exchange of ideas between the SRE and DevOps ecosystem in the mid-2010s, we really were able to crystallize that SRE was one very opinionated implementation of DevOps, that it aspired to all the principles that DevOps did, but had very specific prescriptive mechanisms. Instead of saying generally you should measure things, we said you must have SLOs, you must measure the amount of toil or break fix work on your team. But SRE is not necessarily the only way of doing these things, and today I wouldn't necessarily tell people, you know, go pick up the SRE book and thumb through it and you know, copy paste that onto your teams, right? Like that doesn't really work. That doesn't work even at Google to kind of copy paste the Google SRE way. So crucially, I think all of these things assume some kind of split between development and operations, right? Even at Google, right? Like, you know, the SREs, sure. We said, you know, the amount of SRE toil is capped at 50% and anything that exceeds that goes to the devs. But there are still kind of more dev, more dev focused teams and more SRE operationally focused teams, right? Like there, there's kind of this split across a divide. So what if we didn't have that divide? So it's important to emphasize that platform engineering should not just be another rename of the ops team. So why is this? Well, platform teams, what we do is we work higher up the stack than operations or, or DevOps teams. 
right? What we're focusing on doing is to bring together the right set of tooling. Some of it may be implemented in-house, some of it brought in from open source, and some of it brought in from vendors, right? The key thing here is to develop this kind of default stack of how do we implement those first eight things? What's our standard way in the organization? How do we make it as easy as possible for people to adopt? And one implementation of that, for instance, is when we talk about observability, right? Maybe instead of saying, you know what, the platform team is responsible for running our Prometheus and running our Grafana, maybe instead the observability team should focus on figuring out what are our instrumentation standards? What are semantic conventions? What are these fields named? How do we make sure that observability automatic instrumentation is built into the libraries that everyone builds with? So that instead of just you know, being the sink where people send whatever logging data they have and you're you know, fighting people off with a stick telling them, no, don't log that, no, don't log that, right? Like it's gonna cost too much. Maybe instead the right thing for a platform team that's doing a sprint on observability to do is to figure out, okay, how do we make this integrate with our vendors as smoothly as possible and give teams good standards and guardrails so that they can achieve appropriate observability on their own? In general, right, like our goal is to make it easy and fast to do the right stuff and hard to do the wrong stuff. So the more friction that we take away from our teams, the less tempted they're going to be to kind of develop their own in-house IT. So when you do this higher order work and force multiplying, this doesn't only extend to reliability, this also means that you can have security and compliance be part of your platform team. That you can start to take on things like, you know, hey, we'd like to make sure that, you know, we're handling our patching across the board, right? Or let's, let's make sure that we're all running the same version of React, or we're all running the same version of, of Node.js, right? And we can focus on performance engineering, the more performance critical parts of our stack, and otherwise identifying which teams need the most help and then going out and helping them so that our entire organization is leveling up at the same time. So that's how you build a winning team, is these eight initial things plus adopting platform uh, engineering teams to help us tie it all together and develop paved paths and systematizing everything. So our entire organization has a stable platform to build on and everyone knows exactly what they should be doing to own their own software in production, enabled by the platform. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much. And feel free to check out uh, this blog post written by my uh, colleague, Jessica Kerr, which talks about how platform engineering and observability relate to the Dora metrics. Thank you very much.